Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Ambassador Bhadra Kumar and we are going to discuss the current say, imbroglio in Saudi Arabia which has involved President Trump saying he believes that the prince, crown prince has done no wrong and it's all the fault of other people. He's also presented a bill of $450 billion for having said this, one presumes. There's been a lot of criticism that Trump is cynical, but hasn't this been always the US policy that they have supported, shall we say, human right violators when there was money involved or American interests and opposed quote unquote human right violators when they're against American policy? Absolutely. You know, it's uh, <clears throat> from the point of view of uh, the international community, the stunning thing about this statement is that Trump has done us a favor. You know, uh, this is US foreign policy. You put it, you nailed it, you know. Uh, it's completely self-centered, devoid of any principles. You call it pragmatism, realism, whatever, that is using sophistry. But ultimately, doing what's in America's interests and any kind of uh, compromises with uh, principles or uh, justice or fair play is possible if the objective is in terms of bringing some returns for America. What Trump has done is completely consistent and if you noticed it on the uh, web page of the White House, this uh, statement starts with the slogan, America first. This is really, though the caption says it's on Saudi Arabia, it's really not about uh, Saudi Arabia, it's America first. He starts the statement with that uh, slogan, which is there on the website in italics, and he ends the statement with this, America first. So you see, it's a statement on America first, basically. Historically speaking, this has been the American foreign policy and he's reiterated it. No American foreign policy president has ever dared to say this as openly and candidly. No fig leaf. No fig leaf. And uh, he's uh, completely, maybe he said it with a vengeance because uh, he had a predecessor whom he hates, who always used to speak about American exceptionalism. Now he's made it very clear that that is completely bogus. There's no such thing as American exceptionalism. It's sheer greed of Absolutely. the United States yes. and its self-interest. It goes to the credit of Trump that he brought this in. Uh, why did he bring it in? He brought it in not to spite Obama or not to uh, you know, make a confession or anything like that. He sizes up that the kind of line that he's going to take on Saudi Arabia will have the highest acceptability in the American public opinion if he projects it as what it is really, that this is in the American national interest. He's giving 450 billion reasons yes. why the United States public should support yes, him yes. on this. And that in turn will make the lawmakers in the US Congress think twice if they try to blackmail uh, Trump or pressure. There is always a method in Trump's madness. He clearly anticipates that the likelihood of uh, more damaging materials to come. And uh, these can come from sources other than American sources. We know that Turkey is sitting on a lot of uh, information and he knows it too. So therefore, if you analyze the statement closely, what do you, what do you see there? He has not supported the Saudi stance at all. He has uh, taken a detour to justify why the preservation of this relationship is of the utmost importance for the United States. He has even mentioned there that uh, the Crown Prince, Mohammed Salman, may have known it, or maybe he has not known it. 
he has even left it open. So he is hinting there that there may be a requirement for a plan B. This may not be the final uh, position. Meanwhile, what he has done is he has praised the uh, Saudi Arabians for being a consistent ally of the United States. And in the bargain, he has slipped in a few demands. He has told the Saudi Arabians that he expects them to bankroll the American military presence in the Middle East. He praised them to the heavens that they have been the staunchest supporter of the United States in its fight for fight against radical Islamic terrorism. Which as we know has been underpinned by Saudi Arabia. Yes, yes. So it's now, just the opposite. Can you imagine, can there be a more cynical statement than that by a world statesman that Saudi Arabia is so lily white that it is America's strongest supporter. Now this is a country which probably had its hand fully in the 9-11 attack on the World Trade Center in the United States. That's the country that Trump is praising. But then the flip side is he is telling them, look buddies, the money must continue to flow. So you see, it's a, it's a very carefully uh, drafted statement, extremely ruthless in its strategic calculations. Secondly, he has gently reminded them that you promised me when I came there in November last year that uh, you would invest $450 billion in the American economy. And this was reinforced, or reiterated also when the Saudi Crown Prince later visited the United States for projects relating to America first. And then he has also said that this also includes $110 billion for purchasing arms. And he has also mentioned the companies from which the Saudi Arabians have agreed to Lockheed, Boeing and all that to buy. Now, <coughs> it has come out in the American press that the Saudis have not done anything on this arms purchases really so far and that all he has said about this uh, creating tens of thousands of uh, jobs in the US is all, uh, all in the air only. So he has linked that with the Khashoggi issue. This is not just about money. This is also about, uh, and I am going to substantiate uh, the point which I wanted to make in the downstream that this is a tall demand for the Saudis and for what reasons and there is going to be a problem here. So you have to bankroll the military presence, $450 billion, out of that a segment of $110 million, which is outright purchase, which you know how lucrative defense deals are, which means basically transferring wealth from Saudi Arabia to the United States. Then comes this question about, there's a major contradiction here on the question of oil. Now, the relationship was anchored on the understanding between Franklin Roosevelt and the Saudi king in 1945, in the immediate aftermath of the Yalta summit when the war was ending and the Americans were already looking at the post-World War II uh, scenario and were preparing themselves for a quantum leap on the global stage as a superpower. They're just arriving as a superpower. And the biggest underpinning they gave to, for that quantum leap was this relationship with the Saudi Arabians. This went, worked splendidly well for both this sides. This was really denominating all oil deals in dollars, which was the strength of the dollar economy yes. for the last, that last is, yeah, 60, the Saudi, 70 Saudis years. would have seamless <laughs> political security support from the United States. And in lieu of that, like to use George Kennan's words, famous words, those are our resources. The resources will be handled by the United States. This was the, this was the whole package at that time. Now, there has been a phenomenal shift in the calculus behind this deal 
in the most recent years, shale, America's uh, diminishing dependence on the Saudi oil, and America's growing profile as an oil exporter, oil and gas exporter. So the two countries have now become virtually competitors for the world market. They are, we are moving into a different uh, phase altogether. Not only that, there is a clash of interests. Clash of interests in so far as the shale oil needs a price which is high enough for the investments to bring in returns. It's about seventy dollars. Yes, yes, to be something like this. Something that range. But then the point is, if the shale oil, after the investments have done, uh, been made, and if the production becomes in a big way and the export turns out, etc., it can come down also. But on the other hand, uh, if the price is too high, it will hurt the American economy, which is in a boom undeniably today, and the credit goes to Trump in the upcoming 2020 presidential poll. And therefore, certainly between now and 2020, the price should not shoot up in a way that it will become a factor of domestic discontent, uh, socially, economically, and so on. And certainly, Western allies, but Trump doesn't think yeah, about yeah. the yeah, Western allies. So um, there is a clash of interest here, because uh, it's very well known that Saudi Arabia is in financial difficulties. You know, we have a conception that Saudis have a lot of money to throw around, but that's not really the case now, because there's a growing unemployment, there's a very big unemployment problem, and it's a very young society, rising expectations, and the kind of a subsidy which used to be given to people is no longer sustainable. And this uh, Crown Prince's uh, program called Vision 2020, 20, 30. 30, 2030, and now it may be, I read, extended as 2035, is basically in two, three directions. One is this, that uh, they should reduce their dependency on oil and should diversify their uh, economy. And uh, secondly, uh, they must attract a lot of investments in Saudi Arabia uh, from, uh, in terms of FDI. Hmm? And uh, thirdly, uh, to uh, find resources for this ambitious program. They have to find resources. This is a, this is, it's a different uh, ball game altogether. And one of the source ways that they can get these resources is in terms of putting on the market the Aramco. Aramco shares public. Public IPO. IPO. Now, the main reason why Trump went to Saudi Arabia, fairly well known in all people who have been following this, is that he wanted Aramco to be listed in New York. Wall Street. Wall Street. And then what happens is this equity will be more or less cornered by the American companies. So uh, even though it is 5% only, uh, you know, Aramco's uh, market value is uh, regarded as somewhere about some absurd amount, you know, some few trillion dollars worth. You know, I mean, not many countries come even uh, anywhere near that, close to that. So uh, this is a big deal for the Americans. But uh, Saudis are hesitant because there is a legislation which allows these 9-11 victims to sue Saudi Arabia. So they were afraid that if the IPO takes place there, they, they may get into very serious trouble. So they're hesitant and the IPO which was to have been this year has been postponed to next year and maybe even beyond that. And meanwhile, they even started discussing about uh, places like Shanghai to have this IPO. To have it outside the jurisdiction of the, the US jurisdiction of the United States. So I'm uh, placing on the table the contradictions on the oil question that have uh, shaped up you know, between the two countries. 
uh, uh, keeping 1945 as the benchmark and see how the situation has changed today. It's not easy for Saudi Arabia to fulfill Trump's demands. No. Apart from 450 bill they billion need money. dollars. Yeah. Their interest plus. lies in uh, oil prices going up, which has taken them to the Russians. And now they have a back-to-back -back deal with the Russians. Saudis are really no longer uh, bothered about OPEC. They are having a bilateral arrangement with the Russians, bilateral understanding with the Russians to decide where the oil price is to be. And we know well, even though the Russians uh, uh, have budgeted uh, for a price of uh, $54 billion, $54 uh, per barrel as oil price, for their economy to be functional without any deficit problem and so on, and with cushion for uh, various social programs which Putin has uh, lined up, money is always welcome. <laughs> you know, and uh, so you know uh, the uh, high oil price, not very high because you know the, the that will uh, have other counter effect on the market in terms of dampening the demand and so on. A recession is not something which Russians will want. So, but sufficiently high. So you see there is a three-way thing today taking place. The United States wanting to prescribe, control the oil price and the Saudis and the Russians also having their own interests in the situation and are cooperating very deeply. So in this statement Trump has uh, literally told the Saudis to come back and have it uh, sorted out with the Americans. How this they can do it, I really don't know. Basically, <laughs> they're asking for a complete subservience. Because Completely. if you want to yeah. be bailed out yeah. and you want to be the future king, yes. then you have to play ball the way we yes. want you to. Yes. Is the message they're saying. You will deduce correctly the political message in this in two, three directions. One is <laughs> Uh, let me put it in first term, first in in uh, first uh, in uh, first person singular. I am facing a lot of flack from other quarters that I should punish you, but I am not doing that. I know that you have done a horrendous crime; it's revolting, but I don't care because I value our relationship and then I, he says I value the relationship for XYZ reasons which if you turn around becomes his, my wish list. Now you must fulfill them. Now you must fulfill. If you go through the complete statement you will find that he has not defended the Saudi stance even once. That's not the issue for him. That's, I'm not bothered about it. I'm coming to that. I'm not bothered about the right and wrong of what you have done. But I'm under pressure. So now, therefore, I am a stakeholder for these reasons that you promised so much and that matters to me. So what is the corollary? If you don't do this, buddy, then there is going to be a problem. <laughs> you know, of course, if we see the other part of the U.S. foreign policy, assassination, drone, use of drones to quote-unquote take out people, baseball cards, who are going to be taken out every Tuesday. This is a part of the U.S. policy today. And they have also supported Israel and its assassinations in different parts of the uh, in West Asia. So they have never been particular about this issue's as the claim for others. This is all the time we have for News Click today. We'll continue to, continue to discuss West Asia, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and other issues in the region with Ambassador Bhadra Kumar and on other programs.